Vancha kaupata rubyascha kripa sindhu bai he vacha pati tenam pavan ebio vaishnavibio namo namaha jai shri krishna chaitanya prabhu nityananda shri atvaita gadadhar shri vasadigor bhaktavinda Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna, Krishna Krishna, Hare Hare. Hare Rama, Hare Rama, Rama Rama, Hare Hare. So we welcome everyone to our uh, ongoing study of Srimad Bhagavatam for the Bhakti by Bab, and we're on Module 1, Unit 6. And today we're looking at uh, Canto 2, chapters 4 and 5. So this is lesson 5. All right, so uh, you'll remember the first three chapters of the second chapter, or second canto rather, first, the first chapter described worshipping the Lord of understanding the Lord through the Virata Rup, and then the second chapter was Paramatma, and then the third chapter was introducing to Bhagavan, the original Supreme Personality of Godhead. And the chapter went into uh, the speaking of uh, Sutta Goswami, or rather Sonakarishi. Sonakarishi was glorifying the process of hearing and he wanted to hear more about what was discussed by Maharaj Parikshit and Sukadeva Goswami when they met. So the first section of the fourth chapter begins with Maharaj Parikshit accepting the instructions of Sukadeva Goswami and fixes his mind on Lord Krishna. Remember Maharaj Parikshit wanted instructions about how to prepare himself for death and Sukadeva Goswami, of course, directed him, you must fix your mind on Krishna. And after that, then Maharaj Parikshit will inquire about Shristi Tattva. Maharaj Parikshit wants to hear about the creation. He wants to understand how the world came about, the process of creation. It's important to understand the Lord and his different energies. We shouldn't just jump to Rasa Leela and the, the pastimes of the Lord, but we want to, this is also a pastime actually. Shristi Tattva is also the Lord's pastime in dealing with creation. And so it's important for us as devotees, we should know how the Lord actually performs the work of creation. So Maharaj Parikshit, Parikshit inquires, he requests like that, and Sukadeva Goswami then after being requested, he begins by offering prayers. And there's beautiful verses spoken by Sukadeva Goswami, uh, begging, asking for the Lord to enlighten him so that he can properly speak prayers, glorifying the Lord. So that's the fourth chapter, right? So inspired by Shonaka Rishi's eagerness, Sutta Goswami continues the narration, right? Sonaka, Sonaka Rishi had been eager. He was, remember, he was speaking about how we should have, if, if a person uh, doesn't use his tongue to chant the holy name, his tongue is like the frog's tongue, and his eyes, which don't look on the form of the deity, are like the eyes printed, printed on the plumes of the peacock, like that. So then, uh, hearing Sonaka Rishi's eagerness to hear, Sutta Goswami continues speaking. And he's telling about what happened between the meeting between Sukadeva Goswami and Maharaj Parikshit. So Maharaj Parikshit, described here, the son of Uttara, after hearing the speeches of Srila Sukadeva Goswami, which were all about the truth of the Self, applied his concentration 
faithfully upon Lord Krishna. That's the first verse. Right? Can we, 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 can we have a volunteer who would like to read for us uh, the second verse? The May second? I, Maharaj? Uh, yes, please, Prabhu. This is the second verse. You need only the uh, translation, Prabhu, Maharaj? Yes, Prabhu, yeah, just translation. Oh, the uh, verse. Maharaja Parikshir. As a result of his wholehearted attraction for Lord Krishna, was able to give up all deep-rooted affection for his personal body, his children, his palace, his animals, horses and elephants, his treasury house, his friends and relatives, and his undisputed kingdom. All right. Verse 3. Yes. Verse 3. Yeah, go ahead, Prabhu. Oh, great, great soul, Mahataja Parikshit, constantly wrapped in thought of Lord Krishna, knowing well of his imminent death, renounced all sorts of fruitive activities, namely acts of religion, economic development, and sense gratification, and thus fixed himself firmly in his natural love for Krishna can ask all these questions exactly as you are asking me. Verse 5. Maharaja Parikshit, O learned Brahmana, you know everything because you are without material contamination. Therefore, whatever you have spoken to me appears perfect right. Your speeches are gradually destroying the darkness by ignorance. For you are narrating God. Okay, thank you very much, Prabhu. Thank you. All right, so, uh, Sukadeva Goswami describing. Uh, Or rather, Maharaj Pariksha is glorifying, right? It's glorifying Sukadeva Goswami for speaking so powerfully and guiding him to understand the, the topics of the Lord. Here's a little quote from the purport of text number five. We entitled it as The Crucial Test. When a hungry man is given food to eat, he feels satiation of hunger and the pleasure of dining simultaneously. Thus, he does not have to ask whether he has actually been fed or not. The crucial test of hearing Srimad Bhagavatam is that one should get positive enlightenment by such an act. Right? So this is, we often wonder, have we actually heard carefully the Srimad Bhagavatam? Hmm? So Prabhupada gives us example here. Of course, this is the example which is from the scriptures. There's a verse like similar to this. But the idea is, when a man, hungry man is given food, then he will feel relief from hunger, and he will feel also the pleasure of eating and his body its strength and everything goes on at the same time. All of these things come about at the same time. Relief from hunger, nourishment and satisfaction. It all comes simultaneously with bite, every bite of food. In the same way, the crucial test of hearing Srimad Bhagavatam is that we should get positive enlightenment. Positive enlightenment means there should be a detachment from the material, from the, uh, the demands of the senses, and there should be increased attachment for the glories of the Lord and for hearing about the Lord, and we should actually want to see the Lord. And so it should all come about, right? As just as we hear, just like eating, we get these. We get the benefits of eating. So hearing Srimad Bhagavatam, we're actually hearing, we'll feel this enlightenment. 
we'll feel that relief, the relief from the demands of the senses the dem and, the, and the, the, the pulling of the mind, we'll feel relief from all of these things and there will be actually a taste and positive uh, attachment to hearing about the Lord. We'll be taking more and more pleasure in it. So that is a test, how well we have actually heard. All right, so that's the first section of the chapter. And then, uh, we, then we hear Maharaj Pariksit go on to ask questions from Sukadeva Goswami. He wants to know about creation. So he asks, how does the Lord create the universes, which are inconceivable even for the demigods? <laughs> Certainly inconceivable. How, how these things, such a vast manifestation can be created. Even the demigods can't begin to conceive of it. What to speak of ourselves? And how does the Lord engage his energies and expansions in the maintenance and destruction of the universe? Or, or the universes, plural. So these are important questions to be understood. And then, does the Lord directly deal with the modes of nature or he acts through his expansions? So these things, this, these are Maharaj Pariksha's questions and Sukadeva Goswami will reply to them. But we'll see in chapter 6 actually, uh, rather chapter 5 goes on, uh, Sukadeva Goswami will quote from the conversation where similar questions were asked between Narada and his approaching Lord Brahma. And Sukadeva Goswami tells Maharaj Pariksit that your, your questions are nice, the same questions were actually asked by Narada Muni to Lord Brahma. So, that will be the subject matter of the fifth chapter. But here in chapter 5, Maharaj Pariksit has put, put his questions and he's asked about creation. He wants to know how it all takes place. How does the Lord manage to create everything? Okay, and then here's another next slide. Yeah, can we have somebody read it for me, please? Hey, Krishna, my name is Krishna. <clears throat> Krishna is a relationship with the material energy, and an experienced boy may be struck with wonder by seeing the impersonal actions of electronics or many other wonderful things conducted by electrical energy. But an experienced man knows that behind the action is a living man who creates such energy. Mm. Yes, right. <laughs> it's not all magic, right? The electric fan. How does the fan run? Who's, <laughs> where's the energy coming from? It's bewildering for people in the beginning. If they've not seen these things before, then it's bewildering how the fan can be turning. It's a wonderful thing is conducted by electrical energy. It's on the same way when we look at the universe, we can see the whole cosmic manifestation and it's such a wonderful creation. It's so amazing. There's so many stars and everything in its own orbit. And people who study astrology, they know all the different planets and they can predict and 
we know everything which is going to happen, we know when there's going to be eclipses, and we know where the different planets are moving, we know every day, every morning the sun rises in the east and sets in the west, and we know how the moon is also rotating and how we get uh, the cycles of the moon over 16 days, right? 16 days, just like the 16,000 uh, queens of Krishna, and so the moon is in 16 phases, and each, each of the 16 phases is divided a thousand again, so you get 16,000 queens of Krishna, which are related to the different manifestations of the moon. It's all the energy of Krishna, and everything is going on by His in inconceivable potency. Now people see, we see in this picture Mother Durga, and people often think Mother Durga is supreme. But Mother Durga, she is under the control of Lord Krishna. She is not independent. She acts under his control. And this was realized by Srila Vyasadeva. You, we heard also in the beginning when Srila Vyasadeva, after instruction from Narada Muni, then he sat and he contemplated the Supreme and he saw the material energy and it was moving under the full control of the Lord. So, less intelligent people, they think everything happens by chance. They think there's nobody there, they think it's all just going on by chance. And sometimes people, with a, a little higher, they understand there's some personalities like the Mother Durga, and they think she is supreme. But above Mother Durga still, there's this ultimate Supreme Lord who is directing everything. And Mother Durga is moving like a shadow under the direction of the Supreme Lord. And this is described by Lord Brahma in his Brahma Samhita. The creating, maintaining and annihilating deity of the world is worshipped by all people as Durga. I adore the primeval Lord under whom will Mother Durga conducts herself. Uh, of course, she moves like a shadow under the direction of the Supreme Lord. And I adore the primeval Lord, Govinda, under whose direction she conducts herself. Alright, so the material en energy is not independent. Uh, some examples are given, just like the spider. The spider can create its own web. It will create a web and then it will uh, withdraw the web again. When it's finished, it can take the web back inside itself again. And so Narada was wondering, maybe it's like that. Maybe Lord Brahma is doing like that, that he's creating and everything. You'll bring it all back within himself. And the, uh, another example of self-sufficiency is the sun, that the sun provides illumination. It's spreading its light and heat everywhere in the universe. But the sun itself doesn't get illumination from anyone else, from anywhere else. Where does the sun get its illumination from? The sun has to be satisfied in itself. So these kind of things are understood in relation to the Lord creating the material world, how to understand the creation of this cosmic manifestation. From Prabhupada's purport, similarly the so-called scholars, scholars and philosophers of the world may by mental speculation present so many utopian theories about the impersonal creation of the universe. But an intelligent devotee of the Lord, by studying the Bhagavad Gita, can know that behind the creation is the hand of the Supreme Lord. Just as in the generating electrical powerhouse, there is the resident engineer. From Srimad Bhagavatam 246 purport. 
right? So, less intelligent people, they think everything is just impersonal. Oh, it's just, and, and the creation is just by chance, and ultimately there's only the Brahman, and the world itself is false, and, you know, everything is just illusion. <laughs> so this is the impersonal idea. They say, Brahman Satyam Jagat Mitya. The world is false, and only the Brahman is true. It doesn't make any sense. We know the world is very real. And it may be temporary, but it is real. And so the impersonalists have not got a proper understanding of the nature of creation. And they give off their in crazy ideas, very illogical, impractical ideas of creation that just came about by chance. And they say life comes from matter, combination of chemicals, so, so many atheistic conclusions which they have. Although they're supposed to be intelligent people, they come up with theories which are most unintelligent. All right, we'll go ahead. The conclusion is, therefore, that a serious devotee must first approach a spiritual master who not only is well versed in the Vedic literatures, but is also a great devotee with factual realization of the Lord and his different energies. A bona fide spiritual master like Sukadeva Goswami does not speak about the Lord only in the matter of his internal potencies, but also explains how he associates with his external potencies. All right, so th this is very important. If we want to understand these kind of questions, we have to hear the response to these questions from a bona fide spiritual master, who will explain them in relation to the theories of the Vedic scriptures. We may say, oh, Vedic literature, that's not very scientific. But the logical presentations which the impersonals give are totally uh, unscientific. To say that everything comes from chemicals, and they have no, no, no example. We don't see anything coming from chemicals. We don't see any forms of life coming from chemicals. And Prabhupada always used to say, we'll give you the chemicals, do something. They cannot do anything. But we see the chicken can produce eggs. And the scientist is always offering the post-dated check. And so they're the most unscientific people. But the spiritual teachers, the spiritual masters, they can present logical arguments to explain the creation, and they can support these logical arguments with statements from Vedic literature. And so they have actual realization of the Lord and his different energies. And uh, Prabhupada makes the point that a bona fide spiritual teacher like Sukadeva Goswami he will not simply speak about the Lord in the matter of his internal potencies. In other words, the Lord's pastimes in the Holy Dham with his uh, eternal associates. The, the particular people like to jump to Rasalila, but that is not the ultimate business of the spiritual master. He, the spiritual master is very careful to gradually nourish the devotees in such a manner that they become qualified to hear about the internal potencies. And first of all, he's going to explain about the external potencies. By hearing about the external potencies, then we can understand more of the inconceivable powers and potencies of the Supreme Lord. And then we can go on to understand about the nature of his internal potencies. All right, here's a continuation of this quote. Srila Vishwanath Chakravarti offers his good counsel to the interested Vaishnavas when he says 
that they should not be interested in hearing only about the Lord's activities, like Rasa Lila, but must be keenly interested in his pastimes, in his features of the Parusha avatars, in connection with Shristi Tattva, creational functions, following the examples of Maharaj Parikshit, the ideal disciple, and Sukadeva Goswami, the ideal spiritual master. From Srimad Bhagavatam 2.4.10 purport. And so very important. We have to hear about the Purusha avatars because they're very they're of course they're doing the work of the creation. And so we want to hear about the creation, how it takes place, how it all goes on. Not just simply chance interaction of chemicals, but everything. Creation means a creator, persons behind it, supremely intelligent persons are behind these things. So this is, this is an example shown to us by Maharaj Parikshit, the ideal disciple, and Sukadeva Goswami, the ideal spiritual master. Right? You, want, you want a spiritual master? If you want a spiritual master like Sukadeva Goswami, you should be a disciple like Maharaj Parikshit. And then you will get a Sukadeva Goswami for your guru. Okay, so here's Sutta Goswami in Naimisharanya forest. Sutta Goswami said, when Sukadev Goswami was thus requested by the king to describe the creative energy of the personality of Godhead, he then systematically remembered the master of the senses, Sri Krishna. And to reply properly, he spoke thus. Mm -hmm. so, <laughs> so we're going to hear the prayers, something of the, the prayers. You know, we won't go through all the prayers of Sukadev Goswami. Actually, there's a recording of Srila Prabhupada chanting uh, He's singing, actually, these verses of the uh, Sukadeva Goswami, prayers which Sukadeva Goswami offered to become empowered to speak on the creation. And Prabhupada chants all the verses. You may like to hear it. If you can find it, you can hear Prabhupada, how he chants all these verses. Oh. So Sukadeva Goswami's prayers... Uh, we won't go through, read, recite verses 11 to 25. Uh, I don't know if we have enough time to do that tonight. I'll let you read it on your own. Uh, we'll read some of them though. Let's read the first one. Okay. Oh, text number 11 is Sutta Goswami. So when Sutta Goswami, Sutta, Sukadev Goswami was thus requested by the king to describe the creative energy of the personality of Godhead, he then systematically remembered the master of the senses, Sri Krishna, and to reply properly, he spoke thus. And so text 12 actually begins with Sukadeva Goswami speaking. And the first verse, let me offer my respectful obeisances unto the Supreme Personality of Godhead, who for the creation of the material world accepts the three modes of nature. He is a complete whole, residing within the body of everyone, and his ways are inconceivable. Right? So this is a very important point which we all have to understand, that the Lord is inconceivable ways. 
He is residing within the body of everyone, but his ways are inconceivable. Text 13. I again offer my respectful obeisances unto the form of complete existence and transcendence, who is the liberator of the pious devotees from all distresses and the destroyer of the further advances in atheistic temperament of the non-devotee demons. For the transcendentalists who are situated in the topmost spiritual perfection, he grants their specific destinations. So this is something similar to the verse in the Bhagavad Gita, that the Lord comes to give pleasure to his devotee and to annihilate the demons. At the same time, of course, we hear how the Lord comes to establish religious principles. Text 14, let me offer my respectful obeisances unto him who is the associate of the members of the Yadu dynasty and is always a problem for the non-devotees. He is the supreme enjoyer of both the material and spiritual worlds, yet he enjoys his own abode in the spiritual sky. There is no one equal to him because his transcendental opulence is immeasurable. So Sukadeva Goswami has clearly understood the position of the Supreme Lord, that he is the supreme enjoyer and that he is enjoying his own abode and there's no one equal to him. So these are very basic and very fundamental points and Sukadeva Goswami is, is establishing it very clearly in his prayers. And then next, he continued, text 15, which is a very nice one. Let me offer my respectful obeisances unto the all-auspicious Lord Sri Krishna, about whom glorification, remembrance, audience, prayers, hearing, and worship can at once cleanse the effects of all sins of the performer. So this is a basic point of bhakti yoga, that by, off, by performing devotional service for the Supreme Lord, by chanting His glories and remembering Him and offering prayers and worship and so on, it, it, it immediately cleanses the effects of sins of the performer. Of course, the devotee is not thinking like that. The mood of the devotee is not just to get relief from the sins, if we think like that, then that's the mode of goodness. But Sukadeva Goswami is describing the automatic effect of engaging in devotional service, that we will get relief from sin. And then 16, let me offer my respectful obeisances again and again unto the all-auspicious Lord Sri Krishna the highly intellectual, simply by surrendering unto his lotus feet, <coughs> are relieved of all attachments to present and future existences, and without difficulty progress towards spiritual existence. Mm. So very beautiful prayer here, for offering, mentioning Lord Krishna, the, that the, how the highly intellectual surrender to his lotus feet and they get freed of all attachments, even to the future existences. So that's very nice, to free from attachments to the present and future existences. And at the same time they progress towards their spiritual existence. So. We should remember this kind of uh, instruction, this kind of prayer which is given here, that if we really take shelter of the Lord, we don't have to worry about the, the now or the future. You know, often we're so worried about the future, what's going to happen, we're, but devotee just simply takes shelter of the Lord and progresses, progress back home, back to Godhead. 
that's the main point, right? That we're all going back to Godhead. Text 17. Let me offer my respectful obeisances again or unto the all-auspicious Lord Sri Krishna again and again, because the great learned sages, the great performers of charity, the great workers of distinction, the great philosophers and mystics, the great chanters of the Vedic hymns, and the great followers of Vedic principles cannot achieve any fruitful result without dedication of such great qualities to the service of the Lord. So, Sukadeva Goswami is really emphasizing the importance of devotional service. You see, it's only by devotion. There's nothing else but devotion. We have to take up devotion. It's very crucial. Everything else is just going to be useless. Doesn't matter what you do, charity, uh, you may be a great sage, and you're performing, uh, you're a worker of distinction, you chant so many Vedic hymns, but if there's no devotion, if there's no mood of giving service to the Lord, it's all useless. And then, Text 18, which is probably the most famous of the prayers in, in this section of prayers. This is probably the most famous of all the prayers, often quoted. Kiritahunandra uh, palinda pukasya abira shumba yavana kashadaya yanye chapapa yadapashraya shraya shudyanti tasmai prabhavishnave namaha. Sukadeva Goswami is listing different sinful races and he's describing because the effect of devotional service is it destroys sin. So Sukadeva Goswami is pointing out all of these dif different sinful races, they can all be delivered. How, do, how are they delivered? By, the, by Prabha Vishnu. Prabha Vishnu means powerful Vishnu powerful Vishnu. The power of Vishnu comes through, of course, through the devotee, the de by the mercy of the devotee who comes to these different sinful races. If, uh, the, the, I'll read the translation. Kiritas, Kiritas is probably the Africans, Hunas, Hunas is the Europeans, Andras, Palindas, Pukishas, Abira, Shumbas, Yavanas, and the members of the Kasha races. Kasha races, Prabhupada, the Kasha is the Chinese. So different parts of the globe are all mentioned. Our whole planet is full of sinful races. And Sukadeva Goswami says, and even others addicted to sinful acts, they can all be purified by taking shelter of the devotees of the Lord, due to His being the Supreme Power. The Supreme Lord, He's the Supreme Power. And the devotees of the Lord, they carry the power of the Lord. So Sukadeva Goswami says, I beg to offer my respectful obeisances unto Him. So these are some, there's other prayers. The prayers continue up to text number 25. I've read up to 18. We won't read all of them. Okay? But here's the from Prabhupada's purport of text number 16. Simple for the simple. Attainment of this perfection of life is easily available to a pure devotee of the Lord without his undergoing any difficult method of perfection. Such a devotional life is full of kirtanam, smaranam, ikshanam, etc., as mentioned in the previous verse. One must therefore adopt this simple way of devotional life in order to attain the highest perfection available in any category of the human form of life 
in any part of the world. Srimad Bhagavatam 2.4.16 purport. So very nice Prabhupada makes it all so simple. And he says adopt the simple way of devotional life. Why we have to make everything so complicated? Does it have to be so complicated? No, keep it simple. Ah. One of my god brothers, he, he, he has an uh, acronym, you know, acronym, you take the first letter from each word. He, he said, remember, he said it's a, the KISS principle, KISS, K-I-S-S. -S. He said the KISS principle is keep it simple, stupid. <laughs> Right? So my god, my god brother he always say that to me, he said, keep it simple, stupid. And so sometimes we're very stupid and we make things so complicated. They don't have to be complicated. We can keep it simple. As Prabhupada said, devotional life is actually simple. Hearing, chanting, kirtan, dancing, worshipping. Not, not very difficult. So this is a simple way. Simple. Not, not sinful, but simple. Other ways are sinful. And just by that simple way, we can get the highest perfection. Highest perfection means we can go back to Godhead. All right. And then some more quotes here. Out of the twelve authorities, Sukadeva Goswami is authority. Mahajano Yena Gata Sapanta from the Sri Chaitanya Charitamrita Madhya Leela 17.186. Right? It's the final line of that verse. Darko Pratishta Shrutayo Vibhina Nasavrashya Tamvabhinam dharmasya tattvam nitam guhayam mahajano yena gita sapanta. Right? There's a famous verse in the, it's in the Chaitanya Charitamrita, it's also in the Mahabharata. And I think it's spoken by Bhishma Dev originally, it's there in the Mahabharata. But it's quoted in the Chaitanya Charitamrita and Prabhupada often quoted it. We have to follow in the footsteps of the Mahajans. We have to follow the authority. So he says, Sukadev Goswami says, simply by performing these processes, Shravanam, Kirtanam, Vishnu, then what you are, Lokashya Sadyo Vidunoti Kaumasam. This material contamination will be washed off. Lokasya sadhya. When washed off, immediately, sir, immediately, no waiting. Sadhya. This is Krishna consciousness movement. We're washing the brain and people need their brains washed. They're so bewildered by the material energy. So Krishna consciousness is very important. So this is the Krishna consciousness movement. And Sukadeva Goswami, he's one of the Mahajans, he's showing the example. The twelve Mahajans. Sukadeva Goswami is mentioned, Vyasaki. Swambhu Narada Shambhu Komar Kapilo Manu Pralado Janako Bhishmo Balie Vyasaki Vayam. Bali Maharaj Vyasaki, meaning Sukadeva Goswami, and Vayam Yamaraj. 
the verse of the twelve, the names of the twelve Mahajans was given by Lord Yamaraj himself. Mm -hmm. The devotee's compassion. This is from verse number 18, right? The eight, verse 18, which I read to you, which de described the different races of sinful people. And in the purport, Prabhupada talks about uh, the devotee's compassion. I'll just read it here to you from the purport. Even those who are constantly engaged in sinful acts are all corrigible to the standard of perfect human beings if they take shelter of the devotees of the Lord. Jesus Christ and Muhammad, two powerful devotees of the Lord, have done tremendous service on behalf of the Lord on the surface of the globe. So Prabhupada mentions these two powerful devotees in his purport. And certainly their followers are very large in number. Lord Jesus Christ and Prophet Muhammad, great devotees of the Lord. And Prabhupada gives them credit. They've done tremendous service on behalf of the Lord, on the surface of the globe. So on this planet, we know the followers of Lord Jesus Christ and the followers of Prophet Muhammad, a huge number, so many people. So certainly Prabhupada appreciates the fact that they, they did so much, they give people faith in the Supreme Lord, As Prabhupada said there, uh, these are sinful people, but they can be brought to the standard of a perfect human beings by taking shelter of the teachings of people like Lord Jesus and Muhammad. So this is the benefit of association with great devotees. Mahatsevam dvara mahur vimuktes. It opens the doors to liberation. So sometimes we may not understand, and sometimes people may accuse our Krishna consciousness movement of being sectarian, but you can see Prabhupada is very liberal and he recognizes the uh, powerful preaching done by Lord Jesus and by Muhammad, and he gives them great credit. And it's especially relevant in this particular case, because remember, this is a verse verse number 18, where it was listing the different races of people who were addicted to sinful acts. And people, people were sinful. Of course, people are sinful everywhere. We're all sinful people. We're here in this material world because of our sins. We want to get free of the material world. We have to understand how to surrender to Krishna. A pure devotee can purify the entire world. Prabhupada was speaking about great devotees like Muhammad and Lord Jesus. So a, the pure devotee, one pure devotee can purify the entire world. There's a saying, we say, one moon is better than millions of stars. You know, you may have so many stars in the sky, but if you have the one moon in the sky, that's much better than having so many stars. And so if you get one pure devotee, then he can deliver the whole planet, the whole world. So Prabhupada writes, the only qualification is that one takes shelter of a pure devotee of the Lord who has thorough knowledge in the transcendental science of Krishna. Anyone from any part of the world who becomes well conversant in the science of Krishna becomes a pure devotee and a spiritual master for the general mass of people and may reclaim them by purification of heart. Though a person 
be even the most sinful man, he can. Oh, what happened? He can at. Oh, let me see. <laughs> oh, maybe not. He can. He can direct, maybe it just continues from here. He can directly take shelter of Krishna or take shelter of a pure devotee who is under the shelter of Krishna. So, you can take shelter either of Krishna or take shelter of Krishna's pure devotee. Not, no difference. You people, uh, we may say Arjuna was taught by Krishna, so we can also be taught by Krishna's representative. We take shelter of the pure devotee. It's not different from Lord Krishna. As Prabhupada said, mad ashrayaha. So if one takes shelter of a pure devotee, just like electricity, the powerhouse is far away, but the power is coming. Suppose your body is electrified, and if I touch, then my body immediately becomes electrified. And if somebody touches me, then others' body. This is electric. Similarly, one who is pure devotee, he's authorized by Krishna. He's electrified from a lecture on Srimad Bhagavatam 1.7.12, given in Vrindavan in 1976. It's very, hearing Prabhupada talk about electricity is very similar. Uh, when we read the Chaitanya Charitamrita, we read how Lord Chaitanya would, you know, peep, somebody would see Lord Chaitanya and they would become full of Krishna Prem. And that somebody else would see the person who saw Lord Chaitanya, and they would get Krishna Prem. And people saw somebody who saw somebody who saw Lord Chaitanya, and they would all get Krishna Prem. And then this way, everybody got Krishna Prem. The whole thing, it became contagious, just by Lord Chaitanya's purity, because of his pure love for Krishna. So the same way, the potency of the, the holy name, the potency of the pure devotee. So even the sinful person, he can be delivered by taking shelter of the pure devotees. And this is the power of association. We know the examples from the scriptures, we know how Narada Muni delivered sinful people like the hunter Magrari. Different sinful people. All the Ajamila was sinful. He was delivered by the association of the Vishnu Dutas. Narada Muni himself was delivered by the association of saintly persons in his previous life. All right? So many examples, the electricity, electricity, the electric current. So the pure devotee, he's like the electric current. He's authorized by Krishna. He is electrified. Right? We say we, you can judge how powerful a person is a devotee by how many others he's brought to Krishna consciousness. You can understand the power of a devotee by how many people he's brought to Krishna consciousness. Another quote from Prabhupada, guiding human society. Instead of running a godless civilization, in the present context of the world situation. If the leadership of world affairs is entrusted to the devotees of the Lord, 
for which a worldwide organization under the name and style of the International Society of Krishna Consciousness has already been started. Then, by the grace of the Almighty Lord, there can be a thorough change of heart in human beings all over the world, because the devotees of the Lord... <laughs> just a minute because the devotees of the Lord, ooh, yeah, I missed something there. Let's see. Because the devotees of the Lord, oh, what is this? Oh, it's not come through. Anyway, that's in the... Uh, it's an imported verse here. Yeah. Hare Krishna Maharaj. Yes. Can you find that quote for me? Yeah. Uh, because the devotees of the Lord are able authorities to effect such a change by purifying the dust uh, Amaraj, uh, previous one? Sorry? Oh, the you... previous one. Oh, uh, oh wait. I'll... Let me go get it again. Yes? Yeah. To effect such a change by purifying the dust worn minds of the people in general. Okay, thank you, Maharaji. So Prabhupada is indicating here something what he envisioned in the future, that the devotees themselves could become uh, involved in guiding the world situation rather than having a godless civilization, animalistic civilization. But if the leadership of the world affairs was given to the devotees, if we had devotee leaders, you know, like Maharaj Parikshit, Maharaj Yudhisthir, Bharat Maharaj, <laughs> these kind of kings, you know, Rishabdev, these kind of rulers, you know, it, it could make a, a difference to the world. So Prabhupada had this vision that in the future that, that devotees could actually become involved in these kind of things. Although uh, sometimes we we don't always under we don't always think in this way, and sometimes you know Chanakya Pandit said things bad things about politics. You can never trust a politician and things like this, you know. But uh, Prabhupada certainly would have when when one devotee there was one devotee, proper disciple Balavanta Prabhu. Uh, he was the son of a lawyer and he was a good speaker. And he was, a, he was running the Atlanta temple in Srila Prabhupada's time. And he got into politics. And he actually ran in the, in the election. And he had his own party in, in God We Trust. <laughs> and he would, he, he would be invited on television because it was very unusual. Of course, he was a young man, young American man. And he was a good speaker. And he would be invited into uh, different talk programs, interviewed programs, different politicians would come. And he would challenge the different politicians and he would tell them, you know, you have to follow. A politician should be truthful. They cannot be a liar and a cheater. They have to be honest. They have to be of the highest moral character. They have to have integrity. He would speak like that and he would he would really, you know, make people think and people were impressed, you know, when they'd hear him speak. He was very good. Well, I mean, he didn't really win the election or anything, but, you know, he did take part. Prabhupada didn't like it too much because there was a lot of money involved. And, you know, Prabhupada didn't want to spend the money as risky for our society because we have tax exemption. And if we get involved in politics, then there's, there's different taxes and so on and Prabhupada didn't want our movement to be affected by these kind of things like political campaigns. But it was interesting. 
that one devotee, he did go into politics and Prabhupada did appreciate it and he encouraged it. Okay. A bit more. Guiding human society. The politicians of the world may remain in their respective positions because the pure devotees of the Lord are not interested in political leadership or diplomatic impl implications. The devotees are interested only in seeing that the people in general are not misguided by political propaganda and in seeing that the valuable life of a human being is not spoiled in following a type of civilization which is ultimately doomed. If the politicians, therefore, would be guided by the good counsel of the devotees, then certainly there would be a great change in the world situation by the purifying propaganda of the devotees as shown by Lord Chaitanya. Srimad Bhagavatam 2.4.18 purport. Again, that's the verse that Kiritahanandra Palinta Puksha, this is a purport, Prabhupada wrote, very, very powerful and very important purport for us there. And we want to uh, pay specific attention to these points, how Prabhupada envisioned. Here you can see Prabhupada said, actually, we're not interested in political leadership or diplomatic implica implications. At least pure devotees are not interested. Some, some devotees may be interested. Some devotees who have mixed desires, they may go into political. But Prabhupada mentioned, he said, the counsel of the devotees should be given. And they, the, the, the politicians themselves should be guided by the devotees. Just like Kshatriya kings would be guided by brahmanas. So in the same way, the modern day politicians they should be guided by the devotees. The devotees of the Lord know how to make proper use of the human form of life. And Prabhupada's making the point here that we're not much concerned with politics, but we don't want people to waste their life. We don't want a civilization which is doomed. Right? We want to encourage a, a a pure, a peaceful, happy lifestyle. It, and it should be in accordance with the laws of nature. Not that we're trying to oppose every fight, fight nature, but we have to recognize how nature works and we have to work in cooperation with nature according to the plan of God. All right, so we're going on now, chapter 5. The cause of all causes. So chapter 4, we heard Maharaj Parikshit putting his questions to Sukadeva Goswami. Now this fifth chapter begins with uh, Sukadeva Goswami describing that the questions which Maharaj Parikshit had asked had also been asked by Narada Muni to Lord Brahma. And so Sukadeva Goswami is going to explain about the conversation between uh, Narada and Lord Brahma. So the chapter begins with Narada inquiring from Lord Brahma. And then after that, then from nine, verses 9 up to 17, we'll hear how Brahma describes the greatness of the Supreme Lord. And then verses 18 to 33, Lord Brahma describes the creation. Remember, that was the, one of the questions which uh, Maharaj Parikshit wanted to know. He wanted to know about how, how the Lord actually creates. And then the end part of the chapter, verses 34 up to the end of the chapter 42, describes how the Lord enters each universe. So here's the first verse. Sri Narada Muni asks Brahmaji, O chief among the demigods, O firstborn living entity, 
I beg to offer my respectful obeisances unto you. Please tell me that transcendental knowledge which specifically directs one to the truth of the individual soul and the super soul. So, Narada Muni wants to understand the truth about the individual soul and the super soul. He wants to hear this knowledge. Oh, I'm going to have to read up the verse number eight. Let me see. Okay, can we have some volunteer to read? Would you like to read text number two? Hare Krishna Maharaj. Hare Krishna. Please accept my humble obeisances. Text number two. Yes, please. My dear father, please describe factually the symptoms of this manifest world. What is its background? How is it created? How is it conserved? And under whose control is all this being done? Yeah, go ahead. Text number three. My dear father, all this is known to you scientifically because whatever was created in the past, whatever will be created in the future, or whatever is cre being created at present, as well as everything within the universe is within your grip, just like a walnut. Okay. X number. Yes, go ahead. X number four. My dear father, what is the source of your knowledge? Under whose protection are you standing? And under whom are you working? What is your real position? Do you alone create all entities with the Hare Krishna? <laughs> Hare Krishna? Do you Hare Krishna. Yes, we lost you, Manaji. Hare Krishna, Guru Maharaj, can I continue? Yes, please prove. Thank you, Guru Maharaj. Do you alone create all entities with material elements by your personal energy? Yes. As the finder very easily creates the network of its uh, cobweb web and uh, manifests its power of creation without being defected by others. So also you yourself by employment of your self-sufficient energy create without any other's help. Whatever we can understand by the nomenclature characteristics and features of a particular thing, superior, inferior or equal, eternal or temporary, is not created from any uh, any source other than of your lordship, thou so great. Yes, you are moved to wonder about the existence of someone more powerful than you when we think of your great austerities in perfect discipline, although your good self is so powerful in the matter of creation. My dear father, you know everything and you are the controller of all. Therefore, may all that I have inquired from you be kindly instructed to me so that I may be able to understand it as your student. Okay. Thank, you, Krishna. Thank, Thank you very much, Prabhu. Thank you. Yes, <laughs> there are some important points here in these words by Narada Muni. He's saying to Lord Brahma, his father, of course Lord Brahma, Narada is born from Brahma, that everything is within you just like a walnut in, in, in your hand. If you have a walnut in your hand, it's not a very big object, it's not very difficult, not a lot of trouble to have a walnut in your hand. And so everything in the universe, it's like every, the whole universe is in the hand of the Lord. And, the, and Narada Muni is thinking it's in the hand of Brahma. The Brahma, he sees his father as being the controller of all. And he goes on to talk about how we're, we're puzzled because Narada Muni saw that Lord Brahma had been doing penance, he'd been doing meditation and penances. And there must be some purpose to that. It must be done for the pleasure of someone. So Narada Muni wants to understand 
why would he be doing this? There must be some other person. Now, of course, Narada, Narada Muni is a self-realized soul, but he's playing the part, he's playing this part for our benefit. Uh, Narada Muni doesn't actually have any illusion about these things, but he, for our benefit he's asking these questions from Lord Brahma, so that Lord Brahma can explain more to us. He's asking that you, you must be performing these penances and austerities and meditation, you must be doing it for the pleasure of someone. There must be some purpose behind it. And so who is that person that you're trying to please? So Narada Muni wants to hear directly from his father about who he's trying to actually approach by his activities. All right, so Narada inquires from Brahma, the first section. First, Narada's sub-question one. Please describe factually the symptoms of this manifest world. What is its background? How is it created? How is it conserved? And under whose control is all this being done? And then Parikshit's question, Parikshit's question, which is, I beg to know from you how the Personality of Godhead, by His personal energies, creates these phenomenal universes as they are, which are inconceivable even to the great demigods. So Pariksha's question was asked in the second canto, fourth chapter, Sloka 6. And here you have Narada asking similar question again in the fifth chapter, text number two. And then again, uh, Narada's second uh, sub-question, number two. My dear father, what is the source of your knowledge? Under whose protection are you standing? And under whom are you working? What is your real position? Do you alone create all entities with material elements by your personal energy? There is text number four of the fifth chapter. And here is Parikshit Maharaj's question, which came up in chapter four, text number seven. Kindly describe how the Supreme Lord, who is all-powerful, engages his different energies and different expansions in maintaining and again winding up the phenomenal world in the sporting spirit of a player. Okay, <laughs> and then the third question, Narada sub-question sub three, yet we are moved to wonder about the existence of someone more powerful than you when we think of your great austerities and perfect discipline, although your good self is so powerful in the matter of creation. And Parikshit's question three, the Supreme Personality of Godhead is one, whether he alone acts with the modes of material nature or simultaneously expands in many forms or expands consecutively to direct the modes of nature. That's from the fourth chapter, text number nine. So, you can see the questions. We, uh, Narada wants to understand these things. It's important to make these points clear in understanding the process of creation. We have to understand everything very carefully. And Prabhupada often gave this example about the frog in the well, because the materialistic scientists, who are often atheistic, they can never accept these kind of conclusions which we are presenting based on the Srimad Bhagavatam and other Vedic literature. Materialistic scientists are blind to this kind of knowledge, and, and they're compared, Prabhupada compares them to this uh, analogy of the frog in the well. 
So I'll just read it from Prabhupada's purport, the fifth chapter, text number 10. A frog residing in the atmosphere and boundary of a well cannot imagine the length and breadth of the gigantic ocean. Such a frog, when informed of the gigantic length and breadth of the ocean, first of all does not believe that there is such an ocean. And if someone assures him that factually there is such a thing, the frog then begins to measure it by imagination, by means of pumping its belly as far as possible, with the result that the tiny abdomen of the frog bursts and the poor frog dies without any experience of the actual ocean. So the, the frog in the well is compared to the materialistic scientists who deny the process of creation and who deny the existence of any hierarchy in the higher planets or in the, in the they deny the existence of life on any other planet other than Earth. So many things they're blind to, they cannot accept, they cannot imagine beyond the power of their mind and senses. So they're compared to frogs. And the frog dies trying to understand. In the same way, materialistic scientists, they will also die in the course of time, bewildered by the material energy. So the next section, Brahma describes the greatness of the Lord. Text 9 to 17. Specific answers top Narada's second sub-question. My dear father, what is the source of your knowledge? Under, sorry, under whose protection are you standing? And under whom are you working? What is your real position? Do you alone create all entities with material elements by your personal energy? From Srimad Bhagavatam 2.5.11. Brahma says in this verse that his knowledge and creative potency emanate from the Lord as his personal effulgence. His knowledge and creative potency emanate from the Lord as his personal effulgence. So Brahma gives the credit to the Lord. He recognizes that he is not supreme in the universe, that he is empowered by the grace of the Lord. So this is what Narada Muni wanted to bring out, he wanted to hear from, from Lord Brahma himself that there's a the supreme personality above even Brahma. And then the specific answer to Narada's principal question, please tell me that transcendental knowledge which specifically directs one to the truth of the individual soul and the super soul. That was from the first verse. In this verse, Brahma reveals that his transcendental realization is inspired by the super soul. The truth is that Brahma is created and the Lord is the creator. So this is the main point, Brahm, Brahma, Lord Brahma is created, he took his birth from the lotus flower and behind Lord Brahma or above Lord Brahma or the, the cause of Lord Brahma is the Lord himself who is the original creator. So there's the cause and there's the effect. Atheistic scientists, they never see the cause and the effect. They, they want to enjoy the effect, but they never see the cause behind it. 
So Brahma reveals his realization, inspired by the Super Soul. Super Soul is inspiring the pure devotees. They're directed by the Super Soul. When the heart is pure, then we will take direction from the Super Soul. Krishna says, from him comes knowledge, remembrance and forgetfulness. So when the heart is pure, as in the case of Lord Brahma, so he was inspired by the Super Soul. And another question, specific answer to Narada's first sub-question. Please describe factually the symptoms of this manifest world. What is its background? How is it created? How is it conserved? And under whose control is all this being done? So Srimad Bhagavatam 2.5.18 describes that Brahma states that the symptoms of the manifest world are three. Goodness, passion and ignorance. The fundament is the pure spiritual form of the Lord. The creation, maintenance and destruction of the world are the natural result of his acceptance of the material modes as his energy. So the creation of the world, the, the creation, maintenance and destruction, that's the natural result. Because the Lord accepts the three modes as his energy. So the three modes, creation is the work of passion and destruction is the work of the mode of ignorance and the maintenance is the work of the mode of goodness. So everything is going on under the direction of the three modes of nature. And the Lord accepted the three modes and that's why we have in the material world, we have creation, maintenance and destruction. Then specific answer to Narada's third question, sub-question. Yet we are moved to wonder about the existence of someone more powerful than you when we think of your great austerities in perfect discipline, although your good self is so powerful in the matter of creation. That's from text number 7. Srimad Bhagavatam 2.5.20, Brahma says that the modes of nature cover the spiritual per perception of the living entities. The transcendental Supreme Lord, who is the real controller of all living entities, including Brahma himself, exists beyond those modes. So we know this, that the Lord is above the modes, it's not influenced, the modes is under his direction, the material nature is under his direction. He's not under the direction of the material nature, but the material nature is under his direction. The Supreme Lord is pure spiritual form, transcendental to all material qualities. Yet, for the sake of the creation of the material world and its maintenance and annihilation, he accepts through his external energy the material modes of nature called goodness, passion and ignorance. For the sake of the creation and maintenance, and it's all done through the modes of nature. That's Srimad Bhagavatam, 18th verse, chapter 5. So here you can see di diagrammatically the process of creation. Here you see the big cloud, the, the cloud which comes in the uh, 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 from the Brahma Jyoti, there's a cloud form in a corner of the Brahma Jyoti, and in that cloud, the, the, that's where Lord Mahavishnu appears, and that cloud becomes uh, filled with water, it's, it becomes the Karanodak Ocean or the Kajal Ocean. Initially, it's a Pradhan, 
and it becomes the Mahatattva. Right? The Pradhan is the unmanifest stage, but the Pradhan manifests itself as the Mahatattva. And then that mixes with the false ego. False ego in the mode of ignorance will produce matter. And this is the action of Dravya Shakti. Dravya Shakti, the energy of action. Right? So, mass, the, uh, or uh, energy of, not action, but uh, matter, the energy of matter. You can see the, the different elements, the, maha, the five elements of the material nature, earth, water, fire, air, ether. So they all come out from the transformation of the ahankar and mixed with the mode of ignorance and the effect of time and it produces matter in the form of these five different elements. So this is the beginning of creation. You get the creation of the different elements of the material nature. Mm -hmm. And then from the different elements, of course you know this, you've studied creation before, you could, well, well, I don't know, you haven't really, have you? Because you're only beginning the second chapter. Okay, so here you can see the different elements, the five elements, and the creation of the elements comes about from subtle to gross. So the first element created is ether. Ether. Uh, and, and Prabhupada recognized, he said, uh, he was reading a book called the Aquarian Gospel, and in the Aquarian Gospel, or uh, with something similar to a Christian Bible, it said there that in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. And Prabhupada read this and he thought, this is the same as our philosophy, because we also say everything comes about from sound. The first element of creation in the material world is sound. And with sound, you get the element of ether. Sound is, in, is vibrated in ether. Ether means place where there's no air. You take the air out and you're left with ether. You can say space or something, but there's no air. And so within ether you can vibrate sound. There's no other elements, there's no other sense objects, there's only sound. And so with sound also, of course, you get the ear, the sense of hearing has to be there. So it's all connected with ether. But continuing the process of creation, that from ether in contact with the false ego in the mode of ignorance, the next element created is air. And with air, there is touch as well as sound. The sense of touch is there. There's no sense of touch in ether, but within air, you can touch, you can feel the air. You can feel the hot air or the cold air. You can feel the wind blowing like that. And so you can feel the air. The sense of touch is activated. So sense of touch, we use the skin. We perceive touch with the skin. And then, after air, the next element is fire. And with fire, then you have sound and touch and form. Just like fires, you have a big fire, you have a small fire, each fire has its individual form. So within fire, there is a quality of form as well as sound and touch. And so with form also, with form you will need also to have uh, eyes, you have to see. You see the form, so the sense of sight comes. And then from fire, the next element created is water. And with water, then you have taste as well as form and touch and sound. Krishna says in the Bhagavad Gita, I am the taste in water. So water is the prominent quality there, which appears with water. Taste, rather, is the prominent quality which appears with the appearance of water. And finally, from water, then we get earth. And with earth, 
the original fragrance of the earth, the odour of the earth is there. So the five sense objects all come, sound, touch, form, taste and odour. They're all there within the earth. So you can see how systematically and progressively the creation has been arranged. You can see it's very scientifically done. One element, the different elements after another, the gross elements created, and then with the gross elements, the different uh, sense objects are also there. So like this, the process of creation is being described. You can see the gradual uh, development of the universe, the different elements. So matter in contact with the mode of ignorance and false ego, that's false ego in the mode of ignorance. Well, the false ego is here, but you get different things. From false ego in the mode of ignorance, we get matter, the different elements. We heard earth, water, fire, air, ether, right? That was due to false ego in mixing with the mode of ignorance. But false ego, the ahankar in the mode of goodness, then it will produce knowledge. And false ego in the mode of passion creates activities. So you see the different effect, the different modes of nature, how they have different effects. From ignorance we get matter, from goodness we get knowledge and we get the, the, the mind, and from passion we get the intelligence and activities. Right. False ego in the mode of goodness produces the mind. That should be jnana shakti. Jnana shakti. Okay, here you can see, set out on a big map here. Here's the pradhan. So the pradhan is the unmanifested stage, and from the pradhan comes the maha tattva. The maha tattva, where all the different elements are produced, they're all there within the maha tattva. Mahatattva is like the kichari, everything is there. It's all there in the, in the Mahatattva, but it's all mixed up. It's not, you know, you can't identify everything. It's all mixed up together. And over here, this is the causal ocean, you see? The Mahatattva is laying in the causal ocean. So false ego in the... Oh, false ego mixed with the mode of ignorance, and we get the different elements, the five elements are created. Earth, water, fire, air, ether. And false ego in the mode of goodness is going to give the mind along with the demigods and directional movements. It's all coming due to false ego and mixing with the mode of goodness. And then false ego with passion what happens is you get the working senses and the knowledge acquiring senses. And false ego and passion also is responsible for the intelligence. The creation of the intelligence comes about due to false ego combined with the mode of passion. It's mentioned here glance, kala, karma and the jiva. So the glance of the Lord at the, with the creation the Lord's glance. Within the glance there is time, there is karma and the jiva, the living entities. So they're all there within the glance of the Lord and they enter into the universe and they create a particular body for themselves. And then finally you have this section here at the end of the chapter verses 34 to 42, how the Lord enters into each universe. All the universes remained thousands of eons within the water, the causal ocean, and the Lord of living beings entered in each of them, caused them to be fully animated. Right? The Lord enters into each universe in the form of Garbhadaka Shai Vishnu. Uh, 
with the entrance of the Lord, then you get the birth of Brahma, and then the Lord expands also, and you've got uh, Shirodakashai Vishnu, who becomes a super soul in the heart of everyone. And when the Lord enters into the hearts of everyone, then everyone comes to life. Without the super soul, without the Lord, there's no going to be life. So this is Srimad Bhagavatam 2.5.34, right? That's it. This section connects to the next chapter, Purusha Shukta Confirmed. The next chapter you're going to hear about the Purusha Shukta Confirmed. Purusha Shukta is recognizing the Supreme Lord as being the creator of everything. And it's all confirmed in the prayers offered in the Purusha Shukta. Oh. So we want to appreciate Lord Krishna's pastimes, Krishna Leela. But be, ca ca be careful about it. Don't be premature, don't abruptly jump to Krishna Leela. But hear about the Lord's pastimes also in creating the manifested world. So Prabhupada writes here from 2.4.24, the pure devotees of the Lord, however, can equally the pure devotees of the Lord, however, can equally relish the nectar in the form of the profound philosophical discourses and in the form of kissing by the Lord in the rasa dance as there is no mundane distinction between the two. So this is inconceivable, of course, for the materialists. But Prabhupada is saying the pure devotees, they take as much pleasure in hearing about the philosophical discussions of the Lord as they do in hearing about the Lord's amorous pastimes with the gopis. And Prabhupada said, there's no distinction between the two. For those who are properly purified and have the right consciousness, they won't see any difference because it's all absolute. It's, there's, this is all the pastimes of the Lord. We want to appreciate both aspects, both the internal potency as well as the external potency. And it's important for us first to hear about the external potency before we jump to the internal potency. All right, so just to look at the objectives we covered. The flow of chapters from chapter 3 to chapter 5, right, we explained in chapter 3 we were hearing uh, Shonaka Rishi glorify the process of hearing and he wanted to hear more about the discussion between Sukadev Goswami and Maharaj Parikshit. So the fourth chapter explains how Maharaj Parikshit was asking questions to Sukadeva Goswami. He wanted to know about creation and he wanted to understand more about the process of creation. He wanted it to be described in detail. And so the, the fifth chapter then, that's the fourth chapter, of course at, late, after hearing, after hearing Maharaj Pariksha's questions to hear about the creation, then Sukadeva Goswami recites his prayers, glorifying Shristi Tattva, glorifying the process of creation. That is the prayers of Sukadeva Goswami. And then that takes us into the fifth chapter where uh, Sukadeva Goswami begins to answer Maharaj Parish's questions by describing how Narada Muni had asked the same questions to Lord Brahma. So that was the point there. Uh, the same questions came up again. So Sukadeva Goswami was quoting. And then Okay, so that's the overview of chapters 4 to 5. And 
Sukadeva Goswami goes on to describe in the fifth chapter about creation, how every how the Lord actually creates everything along with the help of the modes of nature and the the false ego and the 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 pradhan, the unmanifested stage of the material nature, the unmanifested stage becomes a mahatattva, and then from the mahatattva and then with the false ego, the ahankar, influenced by different modes, you get different things. You get the, the creation. False ego in the mode of ignorance creates the elements, the gross elements, and the sense objects. And then false ego in the mode of goodness will produce the mind and the demigods. And false ego in the mode of passion produces the intelligence. This is the creation, how it's described in a simple manner. Some other statements which we came across in reading Prabhupada's purport. Uh, Vaishnavas should be keenly interested in his pastimes as the Purusha avatars in connection with Shristi Tattva. We should understand how the creation comes about. We should understand how the Lord expands in different Vishnu forms and the work in the material world is manifested. This is the process of creation or Shristi Tattva. And we should be concerned to hear these pastimes. This is the pastime, of course, of the external potency. But Prabhupada said it's important for us to hear about the external potency and not to be premature and abruptly jump to hear about the internal potency. People want to hear, they think Krishna's Leela is only in the forest with the gopis. They don't understand Krishna's Leela is also there in performing the work of creation of all the universes. And not only creating the universe, but creating all the different elements. And, and then arranging for the birth of Brahma and how Bra having Brahma take over the secondary part of the creation. So there's the primary creation and the secondary creation. The primary creation is done by Purusha avatars. And then sec they create all the different elements. And then Brahma comes along and he does the secondary creation. He's like the engineer. You know, the, the example was given of a gardener. The, the, the gardener doesn't actually produce any seeds. He, he's given the seeds or he gets seeds and he will plant the seeds and he will water the seeds and he will cultivate them and produce things from the seeds. But he has to be given seeds. He cannot work without the seeds. So the example of the gardener is very relevant in the case to the in the case of the creation. Brahma is like Brahma's position is like a gardener. He's not actually a creator. He's more like a gardener. He's given the seeds. Or like an engineer, the engineer is given the parts and he has to put them together. So Brahma is given the elements and he has to arrange the bodies of the different living entities. So this is Shristi Tattva, the process of creation. All right, then Prabhupada's mood and mission, there was a nice statement in text 18. That was a prayer, Kirita Hanandra Palinda Pukisha, the prayer offered by Sukadeva Goswami. Uh, so in the purport Prabhupada wrote, if the leadership of world affairs is entrusted to the devotees of the Lord. So Prabhupada's mood and mission is certainly strongly coming out in that purport. And Prabhupada is expressing his desire, his interest, his desire to see the devotees actually uh, become involved in world affairs and actually influence. We hope one day it will come about. 
that we can fulfill Srila Prabhupada's mission and we can give the proper direction to the world and make the world a better place, a, a more peaceful place, a more harmonious place with a, a home for everyone and people can fulfill the mission of human life, which is not just sense, gra not sense gratification, but the mission of human life is to awaken our God consciousness so that we can go back home, back to Godhead. So that is the real leadership which is required to awaken people to the real goal of life. And uh, another quote from Prabhupada was there, a Vaishnava therefore can accept a bona fide disciple from any part of the world without any consideration of caste and creed. So this is again the same verse, text number 18, that Kirita Manandra Palinda Pulkusha. So Vaishnava, devotees of the Lord, they can accept people from any kind of position, caste or creed, and we, we can accept them as bona fide disciples. And so Prabhupada did that, he went to Africa, he initiated people there, he went to South America, he went to Russia, he went everywhere. And China also, the Chinese also came when Prabhupada initiated the first Chinese devotee. Prabhupada said, bring him to Mayapur. And Prabhupada was proud to tell his god brothers that the Chinese are also coming. So <laughs> Prabhupada was preaching like this to his god brothers, that people all over the world, they can take to Krishna consciousness. The devotees, they see the opportunity to give Krishna consciousness everywhere without consideration. We don't consider the caste or the creed or the color or the race. It's not important. Every living entity is part and parcel of Lord Krishna and we want to give them the opportunity to become Krishna conscious. And then preaching application, explain, we explained the statement, Jesus Christ and Mohammed, two powerful devotees of the Lord, have done tremendous service on behalf of the Lord. Certainly tremendous service, they have so many followers, so many centers, so many churches and mosques have been established around the world. So they did tremendous service on behalf of the Lord because they brought people, they brought people from sinful positions, they were sinful people and they brought them to God consciousness. They brought them to develop their faith in God. So that was very great activity, very powerful. So Prabhupada is appreciating them and glorifying them, recognizing them. And then we also explain the, the frog in the well analogy, the frog in the well comparing the materialistic scientists, the atheists, the frog in the well cannot imagine the ocean in the same way materialistic scientists and atheists, they cannot understand how there's a Supreme Lord and how there's a spiritual world and how there's living entities on different places, higher and lower in the universe. All of these things are beyond the power of their mind and senses. So their position is compared to a frog in the well, that the frog cannot admit that there's such a thing as the ocean. And ultimately he dies trying to understand that there's something greater than the ocean. Or he tries to understand the ocean with his limited senses can never succeed. So the same way materialistic scientists and atheistic people, they try to understand, even they try to understand God consciousness, they try to understand it with their limited mind and senses. So they can never be successful. So the frog in the well is a very appropriate analogy for such people. Okay, so that's the end of the chapter. Are there any questions? We still have 10 minutes left. 
Yeah? Anybody has any questions from these classes today? There's two chapters we covered quickly today. Any, any questions at all on the other chapters? Is everything okay? The false ego is one of the elements of the Lord. It's one of the, the right? Bumerapo nalo vayu kamano buddhir evacha. Right? The earth, water, fire, air, ether, mind, intelligence, and ego, all together these eight comprise my separated material elements, material energy. So the ego is there, the ahankar, that ego, that is one of the elements of the Lord. It's not necessarily of the living entity, but the living entity identifies with part of the false ego. It's, it's the Lord's energy, his external energy, part of his external energy. It's de described as being his prakriti, separated energy. Yeah. So the living entity in association with the material energy, he identifies with the material energy, and in this way he becomes influenced by the, diff by the false ego. And the false ego is in the different modes. It can be in the mode of goodness, it can be in the mode of passion, and it can be in the mode of ignorance. Depending on the condition of the living entity, he associates with a particular kind of ego. Mm -hmm. Of course, that ego that is part of the subtle body, the subtle body is coming with the soul, you know, we're eternal living entities, we're jiva, jivatmas, we're living entities. At the time of death, we take the, the subtle body accompanies our soul. So we, the ego goes with us. The ego which we've acquired in different bodies goes with us at the time of death. And we take our next birth, we already have acquired a particular kind of ego from the previous life just as we have a mind and intelligence from the previous life, we have also an ego. So it's there, it, but it, it can change, it's not eternal. It will also change depending on association, depending on our different activities, Does that help you? Thank you so much. Okay. Hare Krishna Maharaj. Yes, Manaji. Um, I just, um, so, so ideally, um, just what I have understood, I just want to know if that's the right way. Like, so, so ideally, the false ego, uh, the, the thought should be that um, I'm part and parcel of Lord. I'm, 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 I'm constitutionally I'm meant to serve the Lord with loving service. So that should be the right uh, way of thinking, or or changing the false ego to the to the proper uh, ego or the true ego. So how 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 should I I understand that? 
Yes, you're right. There's the false ego and the true ego. So the false ego is where we identify with the material body and the mind. That's the false ego. But the true ego is where we identify ourselves as a spirit soul, part and parcel of the Supreme Lord. The true ego is to recognize that I'm the servant of the Lord and he is the master. The false ego is we're thinking I'm the master, we're thinking I'm the controller, we're thinking I'm the enjoyer. <laughs> you know, this is all the false ego. We're thinking everything is for my enjoyment and I'm the center of the universe. But the true ego is to understand I am very small and I'm a tiny servant of the Supreme Lord. That one Supreme Lord is my master. So Thank you, ma'am. We want to purify the ego. And of course we, we do purify the ego by simply hearing and chanting and engaging in devotional service then naturally that false ego, that disease condition is gradually removed and we come back to our original consciousness that I'm not the material body, but I am a spirit soul, tiny servant of the Supreme Lord. Mm -hmm. Yes? Any other questions here? Anybody has any other question? Hare Krishna Maharaj, please accept my humble obeisances. Uh, Maharaj, uh, uh, you said that the eight separated energies of the Lord, uh, along with the matter, uh, mind, intelligence and force ego. But here in, the, in this picture it is given that ahankar, ignorance, um, and the false ego along with uh, uh, ignorance is this five uh, gross elements are created and the false ego along with goodness mind is created, false ego along with passion intelligence is created. It is like, is this the correct understanding Maharaj that mind and intelligence are created by the combination of false ego with goodness and passion. Is it the right understanding Maharaj? Well, it is not created directly. It's a false. Mind and it's a false ego which is in the mode of passion. <laughs> false yes, ego yes. influenced by the mode of passion, right? Okay. Yes. 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 So it is not created directly, but it is with a combination of false ego always. Yes. It's right. not directly created like mind and intelligence. Right. Yes, my right. Yes. Right. Yes. yes. So it's a very uh, false ego is uh, given a weightage. Here by the Lord, right, Maharaj? <laughs> because we are in the ignorant mode, people, the fallen souls. Is it the understanding? It's always the false ego. Yes. Plays the vital. Yeah, false ego, yeah. It's a prime factor yes. in the creation, yes. yes. The whole Thank material you. You, creation Maharaj. comes about due to the false ego. Yes, Maharaj. Mm. Thank you so much, Hare Krishna. And Sometimes people are puzzled because we understand intelligence to be higher than the mind. So we're surprised to think that uh, false ego in goodness produces the mind, but false ego in passion produces intelligence. So it appears the mind is higher than the intelligence. So one possible way of explaining that is given from an Ayurvedic statement. It says that uh, they describe that the, the, the mind is just concerned with immediate desires, but intelligence is more planning. With intelligence we plan, you know, we make plans to do this and saving and so many different things. So that's the mode of passion. The intelligence is more concerned with the mode of passion. But the mind is just simply desires. I want this, I'm going to do that, I'm going to go there. <laughs> and it's more the mode of goodness. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Maharaj. Thank you. Hare Krishna. Okay. Any other questions here? All right. 
of no more questions, then we'll finish here, Prabhu. Thank you all very much for the class. Thank you for giving me the opportunity to present some of this nectar to you from Srimad Bhagavatam. And we wish you all good luck in your ongoing study of the Bhakti by Bhav. And we hope to see you again sometime. So please continue your studies nicely. Srila Prabhupada Ki. Jai. Thank you, Guru Thank you for your wonderful Go back to Vrindavan. Yes, Prabhu Harikas. Thank you very much, Maharaj. In spite of your busy schedule, you kindly accepted and you came and taught us this wonderful uh, chapters, Maharaj. We are really indebted to you. Mm -hmm. And uh, my apologies, Maharaj, because last uh, Tuesday there was a confusion. You know, I could not able to communicate to you properly. Okay. I'm extremely sorry for that. Please excuse me, Maharaj. Okay, problem. no problem. Thank you. Yeah. Very, but thank you all very much. And Sure, Maharaj. Okay. Soon I uh, will be in touch with Mayapur Institute and uh, if you are free, you know, so we will uh, uh, hope to see you in the uh, upcoming uh, courses, Maharaj. Okay, Prabhu. Thank you very much. Hare Krishna. Thank you very much.